Welcome everyone to the Hatchery 101 webinar series by Hatchery International. My name is Ben Norman and today I will be the host and moderator for today's discussions on genetics and brood stocks. Genetics are the building blocks of any hot hatchery operation. Today we'll discuss how genetics and brood stock management have evolved based on industry needs. We'll talk about the latest research and development and the importance of a thoughtful program that keeps climate change and sustainability in mind. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the sponsor of this webinar series, OxyGuard International, without which this webinar series would not be possible. Now, let's welcome our panelists. First, we have Dr. Alejandro Gutierrez, Director of Genetic Services with the Center for Aquaculture Technologies. We have Eric Ignatz, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Dalhousie University. We have Kyle Martin, Senior Geneticist with Hendrix Genetics and Dr. Marie Smedley, who's the Head of Breeding Program Management at Zelect. Welcome everyone, and thank you for taking the time today to talk with us about this important topic. Now for attendees, just keep in mind, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to you via email within 48 hours. Also for our viewers to keep in mind, I'd like to remind you that this webinar will be made up of two parts. The first part will consist of a panel discussion, and then in the last 15 minutes or so, I'd like to invite you, you to submit your own questions in the Q&A function that can be found on the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to submit questions as we're going along and we'll, we'll address them at the end. Now let's get started with this first question. To clear up language and discussion, what is the difference between genetics and genomics? Alejandro, would you like to take the lead on this one, please? Sure thing. So, when we talk about genetics, and it's, it's a kind of an old concept, but very important, of course, uh, we refer to the inheritance of particular genes or alleles uh, within an individual. So we want to know how they're being inherited from their parents to their offsprings and so on. And when we talk about genomics, it's a similar concept, but we're involving the whole genetic makeup of the individual, which involves the, the genome and how all the pieces around the genome are being tweaked and moved around to build an organism. And I would say this this the genetics and genomics environment has been growing in the last few years, or maybe 10, 15 years, because we are capable now of screening a genome by the use of SNP panels or thousands of markers that we can screen around the genome. So it's 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 make a big difference uh, in the amount of data we can manage uh, in terms of genomics. And that way we can get a better picture of how individual it's behaving and, how, and also to explain the phenotypic value of an individual by the, all, all these pieces in the genome. That's great. Thank you very much. What has the history of breeding looked like and how has that changed over time? Eric, would you like to answer this? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so definitely, you know, compared to terrestrial livestock, you know, when we're talking pigs, chickens, cattle, et cetera, um, you know, those species have been farmed for thousands of years and selective breeding has been ongoing uh, for those species that I just talked about for at least over a century. Uh, in comparison, most aquaculture species have only been farmed within the past century uh, and selective breeding uh, really only started within the past few decades. And, you know, if we consider Salmonids as an example, uh, the earliest report of selective breeding, at least that I'm aware of, uh, dates back to 1919 uh, in Brookchar, uh, where researchers were looking to uh, actively uh, genetically se select against um, frunculosis, so improving survival against that bacterial disease. Um, but really, again, uh, talking about Salmonids here, uh, large-scale family-based selection didn't start until the 1970s. Um, and since then, you know, it's really been focused on just Atlantic salmon and rainbow trout. And, you know, in the early days here, um, you know, farmers were either either their main or only consideration was to improve growth. Um, you know, an interesting, you know, fun fact here is that in those, you know, early generations, Atlantic salmon were able to see an increase of at least 13% growth per generation which is huge in comparison to what you might expect uh, in terrestrial livestock. And really aquaculture species have two key features here that enhance their breeding potential. Uh, the first being that 
because they're within the early uh, stages of the domestication process, uh, we're working with high genetic diversity. So really there's a lot to work with here uh, and a lot to improve upon. And also secondly, uh, most aquaculture species are highly fecund, meaning that the females produce a large uh, number of eggs, uh, which allows for greater flexibility here uh, when making improvements. And ultimately, uh, kind of the key focus here is that there's really untapped genetic potential within all of these species. Uh, but, you know, as time has gone on over the past few decades, genomic technologies have advanced as well as become a lot cheaper. Uh, and so now it's a lot more common for broodstock uh, programs to actively select for any number of uh, commercial traits of interest. So, you know, not just growth, but feed conversion, disease resistance, fillet quality, et cetera. Quite a history. Thank you very much, Eric. Appreciate that. Where have we seen effectively genetically driven breeding programs achieve success? And Eric, you touched on this a little bit here too. And, and what would be the scale of this success? Kyle, would you like to take lead on this one? Yeah. Um, I would say there's a, there's a bit of overlap with my answer and, and what Eric uh, had already outlined, but um, so genetic progress, I really like working with aquatic species for, for some of the exact reasons that, that Eric already mentioned. Um, one is that there's a lot of potential for genetic improvement to go relatively quickly. Um, genetic improvement, we, we define by improvement in genetics each generation. Um, and that's, that's kind of influenced by several different factors. The first is uh, selection intensity. Um, how, what percentage of the existing population contributes to the next generation. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the very high fecundity of aquatic species, um, example, in Atlantic salmon, you can get 10 to 12,000 eggs per, uh, per animal, uh, per female. So that allows you to have a very high selection intensity, which increases the, increases the genetic gains. Uh, gen next is genetic variation. And again, Eric mentioned this, that um, there's a lot of genetic variation within aquatic species because they are relatively new uh, to the domestication process. So you have a lot of variability to work with. Um, selection accuracy is the next component and that uh, that's the ability. Uh, how accurately can we estimate the genetic merit of an animal um, to select it for the next generation? Uh, with the tools that we have in in place, uh, genomic selection uh, and some others, uh, we can we can now relatively accurately estimate the genetic merit of animals, which increases the the uh, the genetic progress. And generation cycle is the final one um, that can vary a lot by species. So, what does this mean for for aquatic species? Um, if the traits relatively heritable, like growth, uh, a lot of programs uh, can can see about 10, 10 to 12 percent increase per generation in growth. Uh, about the same reference that, that Eric made for Atlantic salmon and we see we see same uh, similar values for other species. More complex traits, um, disease resistance, uh, for example, we've been at trial laws, we've been focusing on uh, disease resistance for bacterial cold water disease using some of these tools and, and the other uh, aspects that I mentioned about. Uh, genetic progress, uh, we've been able to achieve uh, in laboratory challenges, uh, increase in survival rate from 30% to nearly 80% in two to three generations of, of selection. Um, and again, that's in laboratory challenges. Uh, we have also, uh, you know, seen results in the field uh, as well. Um, other examples, quick other examples. Um, IPN is a good example, kind of a classic example in, in Atlantic salmon, where we've uh, been able to make uh, pretty high uh, progress in improvement to IPN resistance. Very impressive to say the least. I have to say that's uh, uh, tremendous gains can be made in these spaces for sure. Um, we've looked a little bit at the, the history, the past, what we've achieved now, but looking forward to the future, you know, bringing new species online, et cetera, where are we seeing these practices and this science developing? Where, where are the sort of incubation spaces right now? Uh, Eric, considering your research, maybe you'd like to, to comment on this first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, you know, common examples of 
you know, always get brought up are Atlantic salmon, where we've seen, you know, these huge advances and, uh, you know, they've really started to catch up with the technologies and strategies used in terrestrial agriculture. But uh, we're also seeing genomic information become readily available for less intensively uh, cultured species. And so that's primarily brought on with costs becoming much more affordable and tools uh, publicly accessible. Um, so we're able to obtain and use genomic data uh, on a larger array of species. So other fish species, as well as crustaceans, mollusks, uh, as well as aquatic plants. And so uh, I'll, I'll use kind of my own research as an example. So uh, in my current position uh, as a postdoctoral fellow at Dalhousie University, uh, I'm working on a Genome Canada funded uh, project where we're aiming to develop a commercial breeding program for triploid blue mussels within Atlantic Canada. And the reference genome for the blue mussel was only published in late 2022, so less than two years ago. Um, but with that being available freely online, it makes our current work a lot more feasible. Uh, and when, as an example, uh, right now we're actively working on developing a 50K single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP chip. Uh, that's not, it's going to help us not only genotype our individual uh, animals and track our parentage uh, within our kind of early breeding program, uh, but we'll also be able to explore the genetic regulation of important commercial traits like thermal tolerance and hypoxia tolerance. Um, and we're also actively um, planning to combine transcriptomic, uh, the genetic data from the SNP panel, as well as uh, metabolomic data sets in order to uh, validate our results across a multi-omics uh, spectrum. And really, you know, this is just a three-year project, but if this had been even five years ago, not only would it have taken much, much longer, uh, but it would have required a lot more funds in order to do the same tasks. That's uh, uh, very interesting work for sure, and, and uh, groundbreaking, especially in an industry that hasn't seen any practices like this before. Uh, also, I want to take this quick opportunity. Eric, in the introduction, I uh, forgot to refer to you as doctor also. So for those who don't know, Eric recently defended his PhD thesis and is uh, now amongst the ranks of uh, other doctors in the field for sure. Um, also, just to circle back, for those who might be attending, not as clear on the language, SNP, what is that? Yeah, so so SNP, um, so as I mentioned, a single nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, so that's in your DNA, uh, just a single difference in the nucleotide. So the A, T, C, or G. Um, and so at a given location uh, across individuals, you might have variation. So maybe the of the majority of your population have an A in that region, but a subset of your population have a T. Um, so that's, that's what a SNP is. Uh, but those small differences in genetic composition uh, are, a, are how we are able to identify individuals uh, and as well as study how those uh, small uh, differences in composition uh, might influence traits of interest. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, into the next question here. So in the face of a changing climate, you know, we're always talking about climate change in every discussion here, but and all the challenges that it's going to create for hatchery operators, how can effective breeding genomics and genetics help? And we've touched on this a little bit, but it'd be good to explore more of the specific challenges that it can help address. So Eric, I'll tap you on the shoulder for this one also, please. Yeah, sorry for, for hogging uh, the, the early session of uh, this panel, but um... But yeah, so in both my current work that I you know, just mentioned with blue mussels and where we're trying to develop a climate resilient breeding program for that species, uh, in my PhD, I worked with Atlantic salmon. Um, and so I've actively been engaged in studying the genomic regulation of thermal tolerance of aquatic organisms for uh, a few years now. Um, and so I'll, I'll just note that you'll need to stay tuned for the blue muscle side of things as that project uh, recently started. And so we'll be running those experiments soon. Um, but for Atlantic salmon, I can say that, uh, you know, it, it's a bit of a complicated problem to solve. So we know that thermal tolerance, both at acute, acute and chronic time scales is a heritable trait. Uh, so that's good. 
Uh, that means you can actively select for it in your broodstock program. Um, now getting into some of the challenges, uh, actively selecting for acute thermal tolerance does not equate to thermal tolerance at a chronic time scale, um, making it more difficult to actually assess that trait within your broodstock population. Uh, at least in St. John River strain Atlantic salmon, it's only a moderately heritable trait, uh, meaning that it could take longer to observe meaningful improvements. Uh, intolerance to long-term exposure at elevated temperatures is also a highly polygenic trait. Uh, polygenic uh, is just a fancy word meaning that is controlled by multiple genes. So in an ideal situation, uh, you would only want you know, one gene or one marker uh, to be able to actively select for and see, you know, big gains. So seeing improved survival. Um, but, you know, a lot of complex traits um, are controlled uh, by these multiple loci, multiple genes. And so that makes it harder to actively select for, not impossible, uh, just a little more challenging. Um, but it might be more difficult to see those big gains in the shorter time frames. Uh, in particular, for this area, uh, we do need um, more research as well as a need to understand how selecting for thermal tolerance might affect other traits of interest. So, in my work with Atlantic salmon, we found that there was no correlation between thermal tolerance and growth, at least at a phenotypic. Uh, so just at an observable trait level, uh, but there was a slight negative correlation at the genetic level. Um, so we don't quite know what that means yet. Uh, definitely need to do some more work in this area, but that could suggest that if you are going to select for improved survival at high temperatures, uh, that you might be negatively impacting the growth performance of your fish. Um, but again, uh, we need follow-up studies there to accurately determine that. Um, we also need more studies to look at, you know, how selecting for thermal tolerance might impact, you know, other traits such as disease resistance, feed conversion, fillet quality, you know, everything that a farmer is going to be interested in. So that's where, you know, it, it becomes a much more complex issue than you might originally think. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in here maybe a, a bit on the a uh, different perspective coming from the commercial side. Um, so I would say climate change and environmental conditions in general are one of the biggest challenges that we face as, as a breeding company that's supplying seed stock to, to the industry. Um, and I would say it's also one of the biggest challenges that farmers face uh, in, in the growth of their fish. Um, so one of the ways that, that we're employing to, to try and uh, mitigate this is, uh, we call them sentinel populations or, or test groups. Uh, we send test groups to various different locations throughout, uh, throughout our customer base. Can be globally. Um, example is high elevation, uh, high elevation growth in Peru for trout or um, very low temperature growth in, in Europe. Um, and see how see how the animals respond in those different different environmental conditions. And using the tools that we have, uh, SNP chips that were mentioned, um, and uh, genomic tools, we can identify families or individuals um, that perform better in in certain locations, um, whether that be increased temperature or decreased oxygen levels or both or um, varying conditions. And then we bring that information back into our breeding program and uh, use that to, to improve the selections. Just to add to what Kyle said as well, because I think we've been doing quite similar work as well with some of our customers. Um, thermal tolerance is becoming increasingly interesting, obviously with climate change. Um, and you know, one of the things that we do, it's a couple of things that we do, but uh, is measure the actual like, survival rates as well of the fish uh, within those commercial environments during the summer period. And we've got pretty successful gains uh, using that approach. Like we just saw gains of over 10% with one of our customers recently. Um, but there's a lot of other factors as well that are at play um, in those cage environments, right? Because there's a lot of other environmental conditions there. Um, so we're also looking at thermotolerance trials as well with some salmonid customers 
Um, so those are like specific uh, evaluation changes, looking challenges, looking at the actual um, temperature tolerance um, of the animals uh, in tank based challenges as well. Uh, we found that that is heritable and we're trying to validate that concept against the um, cage population animals at the moment. But there's, you know, with climate change, um, it's definitely changing what people are interested in, like commercially at a farm level. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity with genetics because we're always thinking five or 10 years ahead anyway, right? So we're already starting to think of those solutions of what people might need um, five or 10 years from now. Oh, and one yes, other thing well. as well, maybe just as a, with the climate change thought, like food for thought, like other species, um, species like barramundi, for instance, are actually relatively temperature tolerant. Um, so that might also be changing the landscape a little bit um, as we're getting war warmer and more chaotic oceans. The actual species that we're using um, may change a little bit too. Just to add a bit on, on that, um, what Eric and Kyle were mentioning about the correlation of of the heritability and the traits associated with temperature tolerance. Uh, that's That all goes around what we call GBAE, so the interaction between environment and genetics. So that's why it's important to identify those particular families that will perform better in all possible environments, even though it's quite difficult to, to have a, a ranking of families performing the best in different environments. It is possible to identify the best performing uh, families in, in, in different locations uh, or different temperatures or different salinities or different conditions in general. Uh, and that's the, the or what our aim at least is to be able to identify those animals. For example, a producer that's selling eggs, uh, they don't know where the eggs will be used by the by the companies that are buying their eggs, right? But the but the eggs are being produced in a in an environment that is not the same that are going to be growing. So that's why it's important what Kyle was saying that they can send animals to different locations and see how they perform, and then you can feed that information back into the breeding program and select. The brew stock that is producing the best animals as, um, and adapted to different environments. That's great, everyone. Thank you very much. And and uh, you know, climate change presents itself as as certainly a challenge, and and you know, it may cause some people distress. But it's great to hear, especially like you say, Marie, that that you're already looking five years down the line, right, and, and thinking ahead on these things for sure. Um, the next question here. So if, if someone comes away from this and wants to start the process of implementing these techniques and programs, what advice would you offer them in terms of where to start? And Marie, I'll get you to start on this one, please. You come to us. <laughs> um, so, I mean, doing it on your own, like a genetic program is, is quite a big investment. Um, you need quite specialized personnel to do the analysis and you need a laboratory as well, an established laboratory to perform the genetic analysis. Um, and ultimately, if you go with a genetic services provider, um, it, it's not such a huge hurdle. Um, in the first instance, like what we would do is just do a genetic health check on the population. So to start a breeding program, you actually need like a decent level of genetic variation to select on the traits that you're interested in. Um, so what we would do is take some samples of your brood stock, um, run those through our uh, genetic analysis pipelines through something called genotyping and then subsequent genetic analyses. Um, and then we would basically be able to tell you like how many you know families are in your population, like various indicators of genetic variation and ultimately um, where to go next as well. Um, because if there isn't substantial genetic variation in your population, I mean, it doesn't necessarily stop there. We can look at genotyping other pools that you might have available in your stocks to try and add to that. Um, or as well, outsourcing and looking at other um, sources of genetic material as well. Um, the next step, you know, once we've done the genetic health check, um, is then just kind of outlining what your breeding objectives are. And then looking at what the resources are that are required to actually meet those breeding objectives. Um, so if you want to measure, you know, if you're looking at things like fillet yield, growth, disease resistance, you know, we already have a lot of experience actually designing the trait assessments for those for those traits. Um, and we know like how to do it in a way that's going to be most commercially relevant as well um, for your farming operation. 
Um, so we can provide the people and the equipment to actually um, go through that, that process. Um, and another thing as well, so maybe you're interested in like growth, maybe you're interested in survival under um, summer conditions, for instance, um, but you might not know necessarily. So if we, if we go and measure those traits, uh, what do the heritabilities look like? And then how they interact with each other? Um, and what does it mean in terms of economic benefits as well? So we have another software that we use inside in-house called Simulate. Um, and it basically takes all the parameters of a breeding program, uh, your phenotypes, so things like the heritabilities, the, the variation that you have, or we expect you to have in the population, the number of families you'll produce for production and, and your nucleus environment. And then we can project like what the levels of genetic gain will be for each of those traits. And what that helps you to, to make as a decision is right, okay, how important is this disease trait for me? You know, like how much pressure do I need to put on selecting that disease trait that's really going to give me like that economic return in my breeding program? And you know, these are all like quite big, complicated um, decisions to make. Um, and we've already got those tools that we've developed in house uh, to help you make those decisions. Um, but but ultimately, it all it all starts with the genetic health check, right? Um, in in many senses, uh, the 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 other part is kind of a, we have templates for those and and it's the next step but the genetic health check is the most important thing has is what you've got um suitable uh for selective breeding okay so we just to add on, on what marie is saying we we offer similar services of course with a company that provides genetic services as well um so we we provide what we call um, a customized service. So we adapt to what the client needs in sense of what they can afford and also what they need in terms of breeding goals as well. Um, of course, the, the first thing for us will be to understand what the, the client wants, of course, but also we can also design up a panel of SNPs that or markers, let's say in simple language, uh, that, uh, that will be developed for the species that are working. It can be any species in the world. We can sequence the species and create a panel that would be useful for them to screen from there on in the future. Uh, any sort of trait or relatedness level, diversity level in breeding and so on. Uh, and this is also um, useful for the first overview that we need to do. Like Marie was saying that they do uh, um, a genetic um, health check. So we do a genetic overview, which is the same. That will tell us how the population is looking in terms of inbreeding relatedness. And if we have enough genetic diversity in the program. So this is the first thing I will suggest to any any producer is to have a look into the population and see how healthy it is. If you have animals that are related between each other, then something that you should look into and try to increase the diversity of your population. So you will have a long term vision on how your population can be improved in the future. And once we have that set up and we know that the population is healthy, of course, we can move into Different objectives suggest do basic selection to start with and see how it works, and then we can jump into a more specific or more um, robust ways of getting genetic gain um, generation by generation. But that also depends on what the client is, is willing to uh, afford uh, or or spend on a breeding program because, of course, a low density genotyping panel is much cheaper than a high, than a high density genotyping panel. Uh, but also the gains are much higher in, with, when you use uh, an HD panel compared to a, a low density panel. So that, that will be my my first at least um, suggestion to clients where to start. Look for for advice and look for a company that convinced them that it's going to take care of them and provide all the info that they need. Uh, the only thing that I would add, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, would be that academic partnerships can also be extremely valuable, especially at these early stages. Um, particularly if you have, you know, a specific research question in mind, you know, can I improve hypoxia tolerance uh, in my, you know, species that I'm working with? And, um, you know, the nice part with academic partnerships is that you get to leverage uh, publicly available funds that would probably not be available to uh, just the industry alone. Um, and, you know, speaking, I, I think, you know, all of the companies uh, here, you know, X-Select, uh, Pat, uh, Trout Lodge, uh, Hendrix Genetics, um, you know, 
I think it's quite common for these genetic service suppliers to work with industry and academic um, partners. Um, it can kind of be a, a win-win for everyone involved and reduce the cost, uh, particularly for the farmer. Yeah, and uh, maybe one final comment from myself. Uh, we also work with work with companies on genetic uh, selection programs, gen offer genetic services. And I would say that maybe the overall um, biggest thing to look at is the uh, the economics of of the input that you're putting into the genetics program. Um, in the end, you're you're selecting you're selecting for improved performance, which should result in improved um, improved economic gains, uh, whether that be improved fillet yield, improved growth rates, improved um, feed conversion ratios. But in the end, uh, looking at the economic model that that is going to produce the animal that that grows uh, and produces the most benefit for your system um, would be uh, it, it's kind of the end goal, but it's it's where you should start of looking at looking at that end goal. Sorry, just to jump on again, I know I've already spoke on this, <laughs> uh, but just to like echo um, both what Alejandro and Carla were saying about the, first of all, about whether or not to use the genomic prediction technique, and then also about the economic information. So we, we've run this with a couple of customers, um, some bioeconomic modeling. But one of the issues we actually find that um, some customers have is just actually getting their hands on that economic data set. But it's something we just try to nurture from the beginning of the relationship that, you know, we need a good understanding of like what these traits mean to you commercially. And we can like help you through that process and puzzle the pieces together. Um, but we use that software to essentially understand, you know, if we expect X percent rate of gain in each of these traits, what does that look like in terms of the economic returns um, given, you know, the value of individual traits? Um, and what you often find is that most of the time there is, it's well worth actually using genomic prediction technology. It does seem like a significant um, additional cost, but then when you look at the returns, like it seemingly always makes sense. Um, and I think those tools definitely help to kind of leverage the decision making that goes on a bit higher up the food chain if they want to um, invest in those technologies. It's, it's a long term commitment. And I think, you know, those kind of tools help to provide a lot of visibility um, for, for the people with the service. That's great, everyone. Thank you very much. J just as a follow-up to that, and, and you do mention, Marie, for example, having to sometimes go up the chain to justify these costs, et cetera. In terms of helping operators maybe make that justification, what are, and we've touched on some of these things already, but what are some of the main challenges we're seeing in terms of people being able to get started, but also implementing these, these technologies and techniques in the field, just so that they're aware, kind of going in eyes wide open. Yeah, I mean, it's probably, you know, just what I was talking about there, actually, like understanding like what the return on investment is, is often like a barrier to entry. You know, if people don't understand like what it is that they're getting at the end, um, they're less likely to pull the trigger on that investment. So if we can provide as much visibility and confidence as possible, you know, that this is something that works and this is going to be the return that it has in your breeding program, um, then, you know, people are more likely to pull the trigger. And that's something really is at the heart of like the services that we provide is we just try to give that visibility and transparency um, on what's to come. Um, some of the other things as well, um, I mean, we have to be honest that like the technical know-how is definitely a factor, like breeding programs require really accurate um, and commercially relevant data sets to perform well. Um, so a lot of the aquaculture, like the artificial insemination systems and the phenotyping systems that we use are complex. So phenotyping systems, we're talking about the traits that you're measuring that are commercially important to you. So if you even growth, if you want to measure growth and all the fish have been stocked at different sizes and coming from different origins like there's just way too much noise in that model for you to meaningfully pinpoint which animals are going to produce you better offspring in the next generation so there's a lot of like thought and care that goes into the actual process of taking those trait measurements similarly like if you have you know weight measurements for a fish and there's not enough resolution in the actual like weight data you've 
and you're trying to pinpoint like these really subtle variations between individuals to say this animal is going to produce better uh, offspring than this one. Um, it's impossible to do that unless the data is really, really accurate, is accurately matched um, against the pedigree. Um, and that's something, again, that like we are helping with and we try to bring everything under the hood to give the client as little to think about as possible and as much support as possible um, for their personnel so that they're confident in actually performing their processes. Um, one of the things that we have been developing is um, a phenotyping station as a solution to this. Um, so the consistent feedback that we've been getting from our customers is just that they need to have these like systems that are seamless to implement on site. So they want to go there, everything's connected to the computer, the pit tag reader, the tissue sampling scanner, everything is like connected in one system. They don't have to think about it. And all the data is like going to go um, through one template provided by us. And that gives us confidence that what they're doing is correct um, and all the data is going to be accurate. Um, and that accuracy is actually directly related to the genetic returns. So the more accurate data and more accurate breeding values you have, the higher rates of genetic gain. So it seems something like quite obvious, but I mean, having the means to actually do that phenotyping correctly is super, super important. And I, I think definitely kind of a barrier to the success, I guess, rather than entry of breeding programs. Um, but it's something we've been working on and doing pretty well, I think, with our customers. Um, and then the final thing is just um, adaptability. A lot of the terrestrial animal breeding software that's on the market is really best suited for terrestrial breeding systems. Aquaculture species are really diverse. Um, you know, not everything's ready to spawn at the same time, for instance. That's like one challenge. Uh, some animals, you know, you can't do artificial insemination. You have to use group spawning systems. Um, some animals change sex. Uh, so there really isn't one size fits all. Um, but what we've been developing since the the commencement of the company almost is a software called Optimate. Um, and that's something that we found is really, really robust um, for our different spawning systems that we use with customers. I mean, we get really great predicted rates of genetic gain using that system. And it's really adapted to the aquaculture systems that I've just been talking about as well. So um, yeah, that that's also one thing that we found that at least from like reviewing um, initial consultancies with customers and seeing what they're using already. Most customers aren't using that kind of system that we're using, the, the Optimate software. Um, and it's really hard to use those off the shelf software effectively in aquaculture systems. That's great, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna move on to Always my favorite question. I'm quite a glass half full kind of guy. So I like to keep things positive here for sure. I'll start with Alejandro on this one, but I'd open it to all of you. What excites you about the free the future of breeding programs, genetics and genomics the most? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and kind of opens the floor to everyone to answer. So I'm going to try to be brief on it, on this one. So uh, in terms of uh, the perspective from the Center of Aquaculture Technologies, CAT, uh, we feel like we really aim to help customers to achieve their goals. Uh, that being said, we are not trying to push any client to expend our money into um, HD genotyping or anything that they don't need. So um, I see the breeding programs being developed in a way that is accessible to everyone and most, most companies, most customers being able to apply tools that will allow them to achieve you know, the gains in the population. Um, I think we're gonna, we're at a place where we can, we can start uh, developing select, selection models that are more and more accurate um, so we can achieve the goals that the company needs as well. Um, I think the future also is moving towards the development of genotyping tools that are more and more accessible. We have low density panels, high density panels. We have uh, opportunities to do imputation, uh, which also makes makes it cheaper and more accessible for companies to access um, this information. Um, and also, genomic selection it's it's, it's going to be a game changer um, for most companies once it becomes much more affordable. Um, 
we really see a difference in in terms of genetic gain for all these for most traits um, um, based on on these models. Um, and also linked to this is the fact that we don't really need a lot of markets in, in some species, depending on the populations, to do genomic selection. So we can actually reduce the density of some panels to achieve high accuracy to pick the best broodstock or best animals to use in the next generation. So without losing much information. Um, but all this wouldn't be possible if we don't have the right phenotyping, phenotyping tools. So we need to have good, accurate um, ways to get data, you know. Uh, uh, companies like us do cannot do anything if we don't have accurate data from the com from the producers that we can fit into our models. So we see the development of new technologies that are providing very, very accurate readings of weight or even behavior, temperature, tolerance, all those things, even held by uh, artificial intelligence that are helping to, to chase or trace the movements of animals and so their behavior. So that's, I think that's that's one of the things that's gonna be moving towards um, in terms of phenotyping. Um, of course, I cannot um, finish without mentioning that gene editing is gonna be a game changer in the future as well. If we can edit specific genes in the in the genome of species and generate gains very very quickly, and we can we can actually do that right now. We just need to depends of the approvals and ethical considerations as well. But uh, can we have the technology to be doing that? And we are applying these tools in 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 some companies right now. So imagine you. Uh, identify a gene that is associated to higher growth. We can edit that specific gene and make the fish grow very, very fast in one generation. So that's the future. And this is going to be also applying to medicine when the future, if I, I'm pretty sure that uh, you can, we, once we identify mutations in our genome that are associated to diseases, then we can edit those diseases or at least those, those mutations. It's going to allow us to tackle those diseases. So this this same concept is being applied in aquaculture, either for growth, for disease resistance, for tolerance to climate change, and so on. So there's a lot of things that are being developed these days, and I think the the future is moving towards that side. More use of genomics, more use of of new phenotyping tools, and I'm very optimistic that we will be able to help everyone, every producer in the world to. Uh, access all these technologies. Yeah, that that's a really good summary, and I'll, I'll follow up maybe uh, on a couple of different points. But um, one of the things that I'm really interested in that, that was also mentioned is is um, the use of AI. Um, we've got, and it, particularly in the area of phenotyping, it's it's a common theme that um, you know the, phenotyping and and getting good data coming into the system. Uh, is is critical for being able to make improved gains. Um, we've got some projects going on uh, using artificial intelligence, uh, AI models to improve uh, accuracy and um, and scope of what we can you know, incorporate into our breeding programs, um, uh, the phenotypic phenotypic models. And there's a there's a, that's a, for me that's a really exciting area. Uh, there's there's I think a lot that that we can um, achieve, you know, specifically on traits that are uh, not directly measurable on your your selection candidates, disease resistance, for example, or fillet yield, for example, where genomic selection is is generally um, much more effective than than traditional types of selection. Um, the other area that I wanted to mention is uh, opportunities for uh, sterility research. Um, sterility has a huge amount of benefit to aquaculture species, um, many different benefits, uh, but there's lots of different research avenues right now in, in aquaculture um, looking at uh, ways to create sterile animals. Um, gene editing is one of those, um, hormonal use is one of those, um, and uh, kind of endocrine disruption or um, or uh, pituitary development is an, is another. Um, so that's that's those are a couple of the other areas that uh, I think are pretty exciting. 
I think for for me, it's just kind of encompassing all of the ideas from Alejandro and Kyle here, and just seeing that genetics and genomics are kind of moving to the forefront of sustainability for the agriculture industry. And so, you know, like was just mentioned with sterility and, you know, limiting, you know, farmed wild uh, population interactions, uh, improving fish welfare uh, with, you know, improved tolerance to different stressors and uh, improving resistance to different diseases. You know, I think um, for so long in the aquaculture industry, we've kind of focused solely on, you know, nutrition and health as those main drivers. But I think uh, genomics is, is quickly moving up as as a strong third pillar here for the industry. I guess uh, for my final piece, um, I mean, there's a lot of new or exciting prospects um, in aquaculture genetics. Um, probably contentious, but be before that, we need to really address like well-managed um, breeding programs, right? Um, because we could implement a lot of these great technologies, but it will fall flat if the actual breeding design isn't correctly managed. Um, so for example, we've, we've talked about genomic selection quite a bit. So with genomic selection, you get higher EBV accuracies. That means higher rates of genetic gain. Um, but if your selection intensity, which Kyle was also talking about, isn't right, so you're only selecting a really small number of animals from a thousand animals instead of two thousand, um, then you know the rates of improvement aren't really correctly correctly realized. So it, it, one thing is really just making sure, like across the board, that that people have really really great genetic services and great breeding programs with the tools that they already have in house. Um, and then aside from that, um, I think probably what also excites me is I touched on it before, like the emerging species, um, aquaculture, fish species are really diverse. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities there to diversify, especially um, in the face of climate change. Um, and then with the established species as well, there's also other tech um, that you know still has room for improvement. And so we're working with on some of our customers, for example, on like YY tilapia. Um, and that would be like game changing for uh, tilapia performance. Um, and another thing uh, which everybody's interested in, which is really hard to put your finger on in genetics, is feed efficiency. Um, so fish are shoaling species. They don't like to be reared in the isolation conditions that you need for like feed efficiency trials. Um, so we had we're left with like other um, proxy traits um, that we need to deal with. So. One of the things that we've been doing with one of our Barramundi customers is looking at fasting tolerance as a proxy to feed efficiency. And we've seen that the animals that maintain the most weight under periods of feed deprivation are actually um, the most feed efficient animals as well. So we can use that tool um, in those shoaling conditions to actually select for animals that are more feed efficient. So I, th I think feed, you know, it's something that people are quite interested in. From an aquaculture farming perspective, um, and I think you know for the geneticists, we need to like sort of continue the R and D efforts to try and pinpoint ways to actually select for that effectively in in the other species. Thanks, everyone. The the future is bright indeed, definitely. Uh, I think it's time now that we'll shift over to audience questions, and and in terms of answering these, these just. Take the lead if if you have something to say you'd like to say here. Uh, so the first question we have here is, how do you work on complex traits? Is it necessary directly to go to work on a genomic level, or is it still okay to go with some sort of quantitative phenotype typic uh, for initial generation to have a basic idea? I don't I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to start with um, quantitative. Um, selection methods in the first instances. So um, yeah, genomic selection, I mean, all that's doing is improving the prediction accuracy of the trait by a certain amount. So let's say if your prediction accuracy is 70%, maybe that jumps to like 77%. So um, I, I think the two things are almost like entirely separate. Um, when you're testing some complex traits, usually that's on like a sentinel group, so a sibling group. So when you've spawned your offspring, you split off a subpopulation of those and you send them away for like disease challenge or, or wherever. Um, and it's still possible to 
uh, gauge the worthiness of that trait just uh, at the quantitative level. So looking at the family, just the family level uh, differences uh, rather than the genomic prediction or like between individuals based on their actual like geno genome information. Um, I, I would certainly say so. Yes, it's not a barrier. Yeah, I would follow up on that. And I think it's dependent on the, the trait that you're that you're looking at. So growth, for example, is a complex trait and many different genes involved with, with growth. And you can make you can make pretty significant gains without using genomics. Um, but you may run into long-term issues if you're if your population is closed and you're not introducing new genetic variation. Um, whereas a trait like yeah, Marie mentioned, if you're looking at uh, fillet yield, for example, um, genomics is much more beneficial there because you can't obviously measure fillet yield directly on your selection candidates that are going to be spawning uh, in a month or two. Um, so on those traits that you can't measure directly on on the animals that are going to be spawning, um, that's where genomics has the the biggest benefit. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the next question we have here is how many if you're approaching this looking for sort of meaningful genetic progress, how many traits are acceptable to select uh, within a, a genetics-based breeding program? Uh, could I dip in again? Sorry to just... <laughs> um, so we we did a, we did a, an, a, um, an example actually for a magazine article recently, I think sometimes last year with just using the same simulate software, we simulated um, a program that was interested in eight traits um, versus a program that was looking at prioritizing the four best traits based and, and looking at the resulting economic index. And you saw that like there was like a massive difference between the eight trait and the four trait breeding program. Um, so I guess it's less about the number of traits and more about just the economic importance and how those traits interact with each other. It's not a black and white answer. You need um, all the components behind that, how heritable the traits are. Uh, the other guys touched on genetic correlations as well. So if an if a trait's genetically correlated with another trait, then if you select for one, you're also going to be selecting for the other, right? So you really need all the pieces of the puzzle before making making that decision. But yes, if you have lots of traits in your index, um, the effect will generally tend to be diluted uh, the more traits that you have. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so the next question here uh, is... So looking at more complex traits such as flesh quality or even, you know, pathogenic resistance, anything like that in, say, bivalves, for example, how would you start a breeding program when you don't actually know the cause of the mortality that you're seeing or or the sort of lack of performance? I can answer um, if no one else wants nope. to. Or, or you go ahead. Go ahead, Kyle. Please. Okay. Um, I would say that it's it's pretty critically important to to know what's causing mortality or the decrease in performance. And generally it's environmental conditions or a pathogen of, of specific concern. Um, and I would say if, if you're trying to select for improvements, you, you kind of need to know uh, what it is that you're selecting against. Um, that, that is kind of a basic of a, of a genetics program. We have, uh, and, and there's been a lot of efforts to try and just improve improve overall robustness and uh, generally the overall robustness or overall survival trait is is not very heritable because there's so many different environmental factors that can play into into survival rates and um generally it, it's better to to know specifically what you're selecting for yeah I'll just, uh, there's this uh, oh, go ahead Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was just going to quickly chime in that, that yes, I, I completely agree with Kyle and that knowing kind of, you know, what might be the, the cause of your, your stress or mortality um, is very important uh, because it, it might not be that genomics is your best solution there. You know, it could be a biosecurity issue um, that could be solved much more easily um, rather than, you know, investing uh, both time and money into uh, trying to solve this at a complex level, it, it could be a much more simple solution for the producer. 
also you could, you could still get gains uh, without knowing the cause of the disease or the mortality. We see that happening in, in shrimp or in, of course, oysters all the time. Of course, the improvement won't be sustainable over time until you know what's causing the disease. And that's why you need to jump in and do other type of analysis like microbiome, for example, taking a water sample and try to identify what diseases or viruses or bacteria are, are, are lurking in the in the water sample. Um, but just to start with and try to improve and doing mass selection, for example, it, I think it'd be it'd be useful for for anyone starting or trying to tackle this disease uh, at, a, at a very simple level. And then you can involve genomics and genetics to try to to go and dig deeper into what is really affecting the the animals. Um, agree with um, what everyone has said. Um, the best way to solve the problem is to know what the problem is, right? Um, that being said, if you're really not sure like what the issue is, but the problem is kind of consistent, it's the same problem every year, same impact, um, then that means there's probably one thing causing it, right? And what Kyle was saying, you know, like there can be a lot of different ish things impacting mortality and where it's quite multifaceted, then the heritabilities can be quite low. Um, but if it is a consistent issue, uh, you can see quite high heritabilities, actually, um, if there's one thing causing it. Um, and then also to kind of flip it on its head a bit. Um, so maybe you have a problem at C uh, with a particular pathogen. So, you know, you perform disease challenge for that pathogen of interest. Um, you still need to have some sort of validation that what you're selecting for in your challenge environment is actually selecting for the improvement in the sea cage environment as well. Um, so that's where you can also do this additional like survival uh, sampling just to see, OK, so the disease challenge situation is actually correlated with my performance um, in the sea, for instance. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, just one last question here. We have about three minutes left. Uh, so uh, succinct answers are good here. How accessible are genetic services to very small scale breeding programs? And we've we've talked a little bit about this, but um, and then the other half of that question is how what would you do to protect your breeding work from catastrophic loss, such as power loss, for example? It is becoming more accessible every time. One of the and things we, you can do. Oh, go, go ahead. Um, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things we always encourage our customers to have a backup. Um, so when you spawn the next generation of your broodstock, you need to send a sibling group somewhere else, um, just so you have that contingency. Um, it's really important because you're really generating a lot of capital that can't be recovered in these long-term breeding programs. So if you continue breeding for 10 years, you know, you can't start over 10 years later. Um, so you do need that rigorous bag cup system. Um, and then for some species as well, you can also use cryopreservation as just a kind of extra protective layer um, to make sure that, you know, if, if something catastrophic does happen, I've got that additional genetic material that I can fall, up, fall upon in a disaster. Um, and then I can't remember the first part of the question uh, small scale breeding programs that yeah so um ultimately at the very least you should be doing the genetic health check um and i think that's quite an inexpensive thing to do so just checking that what you've got um is sufficiently diverse and you're not going towards a genetic bottleneck um, there are negative impacts of like high rates of inbreeding on your actual performances um, this can be like, a, for example, just at the hatchery level, maybe you see like a lot of dropout, maybe your maturation rates start to become really poor in the broodstock. Um, so you really want to have a lens on like, what is the situation going on in my broodstock? And if you can't afford those or you're not willing to trigger those uh, extra genetic services, um, we can also use other approaches like mass selection approaches to try and maintain the diversity in your population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to just to add a, a little bit of that, yeah, the, the genomic resources are becoming very accessible. The the prices of genotyping are going down. The density of the panels is increasing, and the prices are still quite low. Um, and I think most companies are looking for alternatives. Uh, we're certainly doing in CAD to offer co our customers a way to access these services without you know overcharging them and 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 actually trying to fit what they can afford 
So depending on the budget, we can tell them, oh, we, we can help you doing this, and we can just help them in a way that they that you can actually get some benefits from the from the money that is spending, but without spending so much. Um, yeah, and I agree with everything else that Mary said on, on these things. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. This has been a great discussion, uh, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions also. At this time, I'll invite the panelists to sign off, uh, turn the video off, and we will begin wrapping up here. So thank you very much. Thank you, folks. So as I mentioned, this is all the time we have for this webinar today. I want to thank our panelists again for donating their time to discuss uh, this important topic. And I also want to thank you, the viewers, for submitting your questions and participating in this broadcast today. I also want to take one more opportunity here to thank our sponsor for this webinar series, which is OxyGuard International. For those of you who are tuned in, I'd like to remind you that our next webinar will be on May 15th, and we'll be looking at digitization. Thanks very much.